Greetings, unsettled souls. This is Sam I.B. DeGangie during political commentary for the media speaks. You might know me from Blasting News. You might know me from Wits News. I'm just glad you tuned in. I'm glad my theme music doesn't want to shut off. Before the show, I couldn't get it to turn on. Um, I want to say before I get into the show, and I mentioned this to people that were watching me load this up on uh, YouTube, which is now live again. Um, I wanted to put this out there. There has been a, a lot, an awful lot, of information regarding Fukushima that even as things look like they could be going in a less than desirable direction in many ways, it's not being reported on, it's not being talked about, and it's not being addressed. So I just wanted to mention that a lot of this information yeah, it's out there if you feel like digging, but the mainstream outlets, the, the Alphabet Networks, definitely are not giving it to you. So if you could help me out, hitting subscribe and hitting share does wonders. I've noticed a lot of people aren't seeing the show, and I'm getting messages asking me where I've been. That means automatically that the algorithm changes are screwing the show over, is what that means. But again, if you could subscribe, I'd appreciate it. If you can hit share, that gets us around the sensors as well. And um, those of you that pray, go ahead and uh, say a prayer for your humble host here, because uh, I'm going through it lately. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, so prayers appreciated. The Ashahi Shimbun, getting into it. Citizens Group in Fukushima puts out radiation map in English. Now, I wanted to start off with this, because... A lot of people have talked about the map, and I've, I've used it for thumbnails before. Some people were under the impression, you, you guys know what I mean, it's a, it's a black map and it shows a, a color graph going from Japan to America, showing the jet stream and how the jet stream carries radiation. Some people were under the impression that that was simply a radiation uh, map, which isn't what it was. And it was being used as a, uh, a pejorative reference in order to tr sort of mock people like myself who are out here uh, talking about the dangers of Fukushima. Hey, Sean, glad you could join us. So what these people did in Fukushima is created a citizen's radiation map that does show the radiation concentration, particularly in, uh, in Japan. Three years, 4,000 people, 3,400 soil samples. And uh, you're able to get an exact count of, uh, of what's happening, which, which is important, particularly for those athletes and the families of their athletes and sports fans who are going to be going to Califor uh, California, going to Japan, now that uh, the Olympics are going to be there. So a lot of this is going to come into play. And it's good to see here that there are a number of people who've been out there reporting on this. A citizens group here, meaning Fukushima, has released an English radiation level map. In other words, uh, so many people see data from Japan and they're too lazy to hit translate. And they end up missing a lot of this. So this is put out in English by the citizens group, which makes sense since TEPCO is owned by GE, which is an American company, at least in theory. Um, it's created with the input from 4,000 volunteers in response to requests from abroad ahead of the Tokyo Olympics. Quote, we want people outside Japan to understand the reality of radioactive accumulation following the nuclear accident, said Nehoko Nakamura. He's a representative of Mina Nodata site, it means everyone's data site, which published the map. The Fukushima number no. one reactor power plant experienced a triple meltdown on March 2011. Of course, we've covered that religiously here. But uh, it's, it's titled The Citizens' Radiation Map of Japan. And the 16-page booklet summarizes the content of the original Japanese map released in November of last year. It also shows projected declines in radiation levels by 2041. Now, you've been hearing that it's safe to be around now, right? You keep hearing how safe things are. That's because they're testing for radionuclides that die within a shorter period of time. 
there is not even going to be a substantial die-off of some of the uh, more toxic elements till 2041. And of course, remember nuclear, plutonium, those radioactive isotopes are deadly for hundreds of thousands. I think uh, ur uranium is millions of years. Look that up, I'm almost sure of it. The Japanese version was based on results of land contamination, it says, surveys conducted over three years at the request of everyone's data site. The group raised 6.23 million yen, that's about $57,500 57, from 1,288 individuals through crowdfunding campaigns. So far, 15,000 copies have been sold of this, so it is getting out there. Uh, Nakamura said the group decided to produce an English version after it received inquiries about the Japanese map from researchers and others overseas in the run-up to the Tokyo Olympics, which is important because they're going to be sold for the good of the bottom dollar, this lie that it's perfectly safe to go there. So it is good to see this happening. Uh, they spent about four months creating the English map working through email and online chats with five volunteer translators overseas, including an American and a Canadian. The English sells for 500 yen, excluding tax. For more information, contact them at it's minonods, M-I-N-N-A-N-O-D-S at gmail.com. Once again, M-I-N-N-A-N-O-D-S at gmail.com. So there you go. At least now we know what the radiation map of Japan really looks like. Um, and it's not much better than the one we showed, you know, that was mistaken before. Again, I the, the other map, it was a jet stream map that was showing the way that radiation travels. It wasn't a radiation map, although the two, obviously, as you can tell by the description, were closely related. Um, news punch. 2,667 radioactive bags from Fukushima swept away by Typhoon Higamus. Now, I have talked about this for quite some time, and inevitably people continue to miss it, so I'm going to talk about it again. Um, Japan was created by an earthquake. Hey, Dan. Japan was created by an earthquake, so it's very likely going to also be destroyed by an earthquake. It's going to take... 40 years on average to get the nuclear power plant dismantled. Now, in order to do that, we have to create technology which doesn't even currently exist. That's problem number one. The problem number two is the idea particularly, and we'll get into it more later in this very broadcast actually, the idea that the Earth is going to be calm enough for this deconstruction to take place is like putting a pile of Lincoln logs in front of the tide and waiting when the tide comes in and saying, oh, well, we'll get this taken, you know, it'll be fine. No, it's not going to be fine. It's going to be washed over like it's made out of Lincoln logs. The cooling pools on these plants are two and three stories up on structures that are wobbly and hard to reinforce due to the radiation count. People can't even get close enough to it we can scarcely make robots that can get close enough to it. And they're saying that, you know, the, the, this, this precarious situation that they've built there to sort of get themselves through it during normal times is a situation that's going to last long term. Four decades, why they take this down. That's just not the case. And we're already seeing it here. Again, news punch. <clears throat> As Typhoon Hagabus hammered at Japan on Saturday, thousands of bags of containing radioactive waste from Fukushima were reportedly carried into a local stream by floodwaters. Now, keep in mind, not only are people still foolishly surfing in Fukushima, but to some degree, you are able to purchase food from Fukushima. And they're talking about how they clean the, you know, area, which... We've talked about that before. That's You take that with a grain of salt at best, radioactive salt. But <coughs> this has now washed into their waterways again. Experts warn that the radioactive bags could, be, could have a devastating environmental impact across the entire Pacific Ocean, reports Taiwan News. 
According to the Ashahe Shimbun, the last outlet we had, a temporary storage facility containing 2,667 take two, 2, bags storing radioactive contaminants from the 2011 Fukushima nuclear disaster are unexpectedly inundated by floodwaters brought by Typhoon Hagabus. Unexpectedly. We live in a world that is so stupid that not only did they build a nuclear power plant on a on an island nation with geological experts warning that the earthquake that was going to hit and going to do what it did did, but they expect us to believe that they it's unexpectedly they were unexpectedly inundated with floodwaters brought by Typhoon Hagabus. That's like saying it's unusual that it snows in the winter in Ohio. Don't get me started. Torrential rain flooded the storage facility and released the bags into the waterway 100 meters from the site. Officials from Tamara City in Fukushima Prefecture said that each bag is approximately one cubic centimeter in size. Authorities were only able to recover six of the bags out of 2,667 by 9 p.m. October 12th. And it's uncertain how many remain unrecovered while the potential environmental fallout is released. Now, the trouble with this is that the dirt and other uh, residue that's in these bags are just as radioactive now as they were the day that Fukushima experienced the problem on March 11. Radio radioactivity, it's not going to dissipate. Some of the the shorter half-life uh, elements, like cesium-134, will, but not the more toxic um, elements like plutonium and uranium, which we mentioned earlier. I'm pretty sure strontium-90 remains a problem, and, of course, that's a direct line to bone cancer. Um, the radioactive waste swept by Typhoon Hagabus represents the latest setback for Fukushima officials who have struggled to adequately quarantine the radiation. Again, they don't have, even have the technology to even use that language. A Statesman Journal reports seaborne radiation from Japan's Fukushima nuclear disaster has been detected in the west coast of the United States. And we're going to get to more of that here because so much of the food, even if you're hearing this somewhere else, if you're not making a mental note to not eat or purchase or consume food from the west coast, then this could very well be affecting you. The other day where I worked, they ordered sushi, and I said, is it from the Pacific or Atlantic Ocean? And they didn't know, and I didn't need it. <laughs> um, cesium-134, it says here, the so-called fingerprint of Fukushima was measured in seawater samples taken from Ta uh, Tillam Tillamook Bay and Gold Beach in Oregon. Researchers from the Woods Hole Oceanic Oceanographic Institution are reporting. Because of the short half-life, cesium-134 could only have come from Fukushima. In other words, there was no other source. It could be based on the time scale. They're able to look at how much it's broken down and be, by using backwards math, I guess you'd say, they just work it backwards to tell how old it is and that fingerprints it from Fukushima. Hello, Drew, and I've got all kinds of people to join us. Tina, Billy, Benny, Estride Raina, greetings, all of you. Glad you joined us. Um, all right, this is from Market Watch. Now, I, I've mentioned a couple of times on here my immense frustration with the, how's it going, my dear, with the push that we're seeing for global warming to be used as a red carpet welcome, if you will, for nuclear technologies. Trouble is, there isn't any science to support global warming. There isn't any science to promote man-made climate change. There is science to show that the sun is in charge of most of the weather patterns that we see on the earth at any given time. And that has been the case through all of recorded history. That's why you see periods of time that were much colder or much warmer long before man ever set foot on the planet. The trouble is we're also paying a fortune for this lie. So uh, this came interesting to me when I saw this. This is a market watch opinion 
think fossil fuels are bad, nuclear energy is even worse. And I'm very happy that even some people who have fallen for the global warming hoax here are starting to open up their eyes to the fact that coal and uh, gas are not anywhere near. Granted, I, I'm not saying that, you know, poisoning the air with exhaust fumes you know, is a health food. I'm pretty sure it's not doing our lungs any good, but it's not changing the climate of the planet. And there is no reliable, tons of bunk science, there is no reliable science to show that. That's why we're moving into a cold period this winter, and they think possibly up until uh, the next three or four years could be very, very cold due to the lack of sun activity that they have seen in the last year. And I, I just read that today. So those of you looking forward to a freezing winter, you're going to get one. Nuclear power is, as of today, they write in Market Watch, is a poor substitute for fossil fuels. Not long ago, writes author uh, Jerika Dumjavik, I wrote about nuclear power plants and the large number of incidents, many of which go under the radar, that occur every year despite upgrades, updates, technological advancements, and research that's put into nuclear energy. That is to say, cancer energy. Researchers from the Swiss, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology have come up with an unsettling discovery. Using the most complete and up-to-date list of nuclear accidents, to predict the likelihood of another nuclear cataclysm, they concluded that there is a 50% chance of a Chernobyl-like event or larger occurring in the next 27 years. And that is, we only have 10 years until a similar event to Three Mile Island, which wasn't as bad, also with the same probability. The Three Mile Island Unit 2 reactor near Middleton, PA, partially melted on March 28, 1979. This is the most serious commercial nuclear plant accident in the U.S. Now, it's important to understand a couple of things. First of all, the very same people, to some degree, who are warning now about the likelihood of a Chernobyl-like event happening at one of the nuclear power stations in the world are in fact the exact same people who warned and were ignored about Fukushima, and it ended up, uh, in some cases, even worse than they had ever imagined. Second of all, Three Mile Island, and we've talked about it on this show just today, the half-life of so many of these elements are so deadly for such a long period of time that, to this day, it's not a real great idea to eat Hershey's candy. This was mentioned by Dr. Helen Caldicott. And she said, you know, if, if I was wrong, they would have sued me. I challenged them to sue me. She's got mounds of data, which Hershey would probably rather not talk about. So they're not going to mention anything to her. You can pretty much rest assured of that. But think about that. I mean, Hershey saw, you know, giving out to people for every holiday known to man, Valentine's Day, Halloween. These people are saying, again, it's from the uh, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. These scientists are saying that statistics, blah, blah, statistically speaking, you know, we are, we're, we're due. And yet we keep seeing this push for nuclear technology, often from the very people who think they're saving the planet, which is ridiculous. Nuclear waste. Then there's the problem of nuclear waste. Just in the U.S., commercial nuclear power plants have generated 80,000 metric tons of useless but highly dangerous and radioactive spent nuclear fuel, enough to fill a football field about 65 feet deep. That's 20 meters. Over the next few decades, the amount of waste will increase to 140,000 metric tons. But there is still no disposal site in the U.S. or a clean plan, a clear plan on how to store this highly dangerous material. Another way to look at this is we covered in depth, in depth, just two or three months ago, the idea in Finland to build the place that must be forgotten, that we must remember to forget. Because things will be toxic there for so long that there is no time period to which it could ever be safe to be around. 
they were going to build something like this in America. And two issues have come up. First of all, earthquakes and meteor strikes and things like that were found to be a real risk for the site. And it could possibly go ahead and contaminate everything all over again because these things stay toxic for, in some instances, hundreds of thousands of years. The other issue is even if we do find a place that's solid enough that people decided it's better than nothing and they bury it there, how do we get it there? Who wants this nuclear waste traveling through or over their uh, land, over their country, over their roadways? Who wants it over the waterways? What happens if a disaster happens? What happens if the people carrying the nuclear waste to the site were to come in contact with terrorists? There are a number of issues more than just putting it in the ground. It's not that simple when you're dealing with something this toxic. Um, while some would say that the amount of nuclear waste is nothing compared with the tons of trash polluting our seas and toxic gases destroying our atmosphere, which it isn't, let's not forget this isn't ordinary waste. Nuclear waste will remain dangerous, deadly to humans, and toxic to nature for hundreds of thousands of years. Digging deep walls and tunnels in which it can be stored is simply kicking a very dangerous can down the road. A can that can break open and contaminate the environment because of earthquakes, human error, and acts of terrorism. Ocean dumping. Of course, we've talked a bit repeatedly on that. A practice was illegal since 1994, but already so much waste had been put into the water that you were able to find levels of toxicity even long before Fukushima. And it mentions here that it is not a clean energy. You may think I oppose nuclear energy in any form, he writes, and he goes on to say some instances where he doesn't. But I think it would be best to go ahead and oppose it in all forms, because even if the science is there to do it in ways that are not as dangerous, anything nuclear ends up inevitably tied to the weapons of any nation. And many times those weapons can be weapons such as a terrorist would use. And as said many times, if the terrorist doesn't care if he lives or dies, it becomes extremely easy to make a dirty bomb and contaminate vast areas with a glorified, you know, firecracker. Look at uh, how much damage happened in Brazil when some scrappers accidentally exposed cesium in a radiation machine. They didn't die right away. They unfortunately spread it all over the area, and a little girl died and had to be buried. I think she was six years old. She had to be buried in a lead-lined casket. And people in the community were protesting her being buried there for fear that her casket could someday crack, and her body was so juiced that if the rains were to wash through the casket, through a leak, and get back into the environment, they would be radioactive again. That's the kind of thing we have to worry about. Um, which brings us into the last part of the global warming folly here. Obama's Paris Agreement, all cost and no benefit for the U.S. This is from Americans for Tax Reform. Now keep in mind, it can be easily proven that the sun is causing any change in temperature that we've seen, have seen, or will see. There is no man-made climate change. Man-made global warming is a provable lie. Well, listen to this. Last week, President Trump thankfully announced his intentions to withdraw the United States from the costly and burdensome Paris Climate Treaty. At a press conference in the White House Rose Garden, President Trump stated that in order to fulfill his solemn duty to protect America and its citizens, the U.S. will withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord. This is one of the main reasons I voted for him. Sick of paying for a lie. You should be too. You should be sick of heating your house and paying for a lie. You should be sick of cooling your house and paying for a lie. You should be sick of a lie when you fuel your car up, and you should be sick of a lie when things are marked up, whether it's food, uh, goods, services, anything due to the higher gas prices. It's all going into a cost for a known lie, and that known lie is man-made climate change. The Paris Agreement was a product of the 2015 United Nations Climate Change Conference in Paris, 
where former and foolish president, uh, former President Obama met with world leaders to commit the U.S. to non-binding emission reduction targets under the agreement. Obama committed the U.S. to wholly improbable reduction goals of 26 to 28 percent by 2025. Keep paying, America. Keep paying for that dumbass lie. Though through a litany of regulations stemming from the agreement, Obama essentially offered up the U.S. economy as a sacrificial lamb to further his own legacy. Now we've got a legacy for this, all right. He'll be looked at as the clown of the century 50 years from now over this. The agreement, however, would not just have hurt the country's growth as a whole, it would have trickled down to low and middle Americans, low and middle income Americans. If the U.S. participation in the agreement had been allowed to move forward, they write, energy costs would have skyrocketed, and in turn raising the cost of utility bills for families and increasing the cost of consumer goods, as I just said. A recent study, and it is linked here by the Heritage Foundation, who are quite trustworthy, projected that the Paris Agreement and resulting policies would have increased electricity costs for a family of four by 13 to 20 percent annually. Hey, if you have that kind of money to throw away, make sure you donate to the correct use of Hotmail.com through PayPal. Go to a much better use. At least the show is really happening, unlike climate change. The study also projected American families would see over $20,000 of lost income by the year 2035. Such regressive policy hits the nation's most vulnerable hardest, who ironically are the same people Obama used to justify the deal. The T Paris debate was also slated to reduce U.S. GDP by over $2.5 trillion and result in an average shortfall of nearly 400,000 jobs by 2035. Let's lose 400,000 jobs to save the planet from the global warming Easter Bunny. Ridiculous. Of the 400,000 jobs lost, an estimated 200,000 would have been in manufacturing sector. Do we see China getting rid of their manufacturing sector to help global warming? No, we don't. Do we hear that revolting Thunberg creature on there talking about whether or not India is getting rid of their manufacturing to stop global warming? Because China and India sure pollute a lot more than the U.S. does. Such regressive policy hits the... Oh, I read that. I'm sorry. Meaning Americans would have also seen the cost of consumer goods such as electronics, paper products, and apparel increase, inevitably taking more of the household income, which such drastic cost to the U.S. Americans would expect an equally drastic benefit on the other end, yet that was simply not the case. Policies such as those resulting from the climate deal would, even with a complete elimination of U.S. carbon emissions, result in less than a two-tenths of a degree Celsius. So they wanted to get rid of 400,000 jobs to change the climate by two-tenths of a degree Celsius by 2035. If there's any question at all why we don't vote Democrat, that's why. All right, friends, uh, just a few more stories to get to. This is Zero Hedge. You can find it on Prison Planet, too. White House formally begins process of leaving the Paris Accord. I'm going to do this one quickly, but it's saying how it's going to be done here. Um, in a statement, Pompeo reiterated that the U.S. quit the agreement because of the undue economic burden placed on the U.S., while insisting that the economy has meaningfully reduced emissions without adhering to the deal's precepts. And Trump's just making everything worse and we're all not going to be able to breathe. The U.S. economy has meaningfully reduced emissions without the Paris Accord. Just like we don't need the government to pick our pockets to give to charity, it's much better to let people give directly to charity and eliminate the middleman. We're seeing the same thing here. He added that the U.S.'s approach toward lowering emissions incorporates the realities of the global energy mix. Thank God in heaven. All right, uh, moving on. Nuclear propulsion. 
how we could reach the stars with current technology. I'm only going to touch on this for a moment, too, so don't zone out on me. But here's what I'm worried about. I'm not against the idea of them doing this, except for two areas. One, what happens if we have a problem on liftoff and this stuff falls back to the Earth? Second of all, how can we guarantee, as I mentioned earlier, that the war-happy elements of our leadership, of the world leadership for that matter, is not going to use this technology for more nuclear weapons invest investments, possibly as it pertains to space. Okay, I'm not against zooming off to other galaxies, but I just, I'm sorry, I'm not dumb enough to trust government. Listen to this. This is by Dr. Jody Malaner. With the recent speculation about a Russian nuclear-powered cruise missile, we look at the ways that nuclear energy can be used to provide propulsion from the brute force approach of nuclear pulse propulsion through the nuclear thermal rockets and towards possible future direction fusual, direct fusion propulsion, excuse me. Nuclear propulsion may have applications both in defense and also for long-range space exploration. It says early aircraft engines. Nuclear propulsion actually has a long history that goes back to the stall of the Cold War. Both the U.S., they say, and Russia uh, developed working nuclear-powered aircraft during the 1950s. Their engines had compressor air intakes similar to conventional turbojet engines. Instead of a combustion chamber, they used a small nuclear reactor with a heat exchanger. This is similar to a nuclear power station, but instead of heating water to drive the steam turbine, the air is heated as it is passed through the jet engine. And uh, they were divided into direct air cycle exchangers and indirect air cycle, which use an external heat exchanger with a coolant fluid such as molten metal or salt. And it talks about the ways that both of these work. Again, I, I'm not against the idea. I'm really, really not. I'm more concerned about what they're going to be used for beyond what they say they're going to be used for. Nuclear thermal rockets, NTRs, use the heat from the nuclear reaction to heat a propellant. Typically, a fusion reactor is used to heat the liquid hydrogen, which then expands through the conventional rocket nozzle to produce a thrust. Uh, the opposite of that being the nuclear pulse propulsion, which would use nuclear explosions detonated behind a reaction service on the spacecraft to push it forward. Both internal and external pulse engines have been considered. Um, again, there would have to be, it mentions in here, the crewed spacecraft using a type of, of using a nuclear pulse propulsion would require a very large shock absorber between the pulse plate and the crew module to even to out the pulses to even out the pulses again i don't think it's a bad idea i just don't know that our leaders can be trusted with what they say they're going to use it for otherwise i don't think it's such a bad idea again what happens if it blows up on takeoff that's important two more stories to get to and uh, then we're going to be done do me a favor, friends. I do want to remind you, and I, I sincerely, I say this like every show, but I genuinely mean it. Things have been expensive, and one thing after another. Again, like I said, if you pray, please say a prayer for your humble host. This has just been relentless. But if you can donate, then that's, well, I guess, my prayer. Please do so at the correct views at hotmail.com. Remember that all the money that you give to me it goes towards a better show, and that is, of course, what I wish to bring everybody. It's the correct views at Hotmail.com. I would genuinely appreciate that. The Economic Collapse blog. Hundreds of earthquakes rattle the U.S. as the level of seismic activity in North America continues to rise. Now, I've been talking about this for years. And a lot of people have been talking about what do you do with nuclear power plants when earthquake activity continues to increase. It was asked when a lot of these plants were being built, and with good reason, it's being asked again now. 
For those of you that think, right, we've always had earthquakes, yeah, of course we have, but we are seeing more than ever before in places where they haven't been and stronger than we expected that they would be in places that it is known for. Listen to this. Why is the mainstream media being so quiet about all of the seismic activity that has been happening all across the United States? Well, because they're invested in uh, GE and other Westinghouse and other places that own nuclear power plants, and they don't want the truth to get out. During the last seven days, there has been an earthquake swarm directly along the New Madrid fault zone. Kansas and Oklahoma have been hit by a very unusual number of significant earthquakes. And there have been several sizable economic events in the vicinity of the Yellowstone supervolcano. But of course, the West Coast is getting hammered more than anyone else. According to Caltech, there have been more than 1,000 earthquakes in California and Nevada over the last week. Again, this came out uh, November 3rd. Overall, the latest USGS numbers tell us that there have been more than 2,000 earthquakes nationally during the last seven days, <clears throat> and apparently we aren't supposed to be alarmed by that. But could it be possible that all of this seismic activity is leading up to something really big? Over the weekend, uh, he writes, we witnessed some very unusual quakes in the middle of the country. On Sunday, a magnitude 3.2 earthquake rattled Kansas. It hit around 9.08 p.m. Central Time near South Hutchinson, northwest of Wichita, and according to the USGS, about 175 people reported feeling the tremor as far away as Osborne and Concordia, Kansas. Thankfully, that quake hit in an area with a very low population density, so it didn't affect that many people. But then on Sunday, a series of relatively large earthquakes hammered Oklahoma, a 3.0 near the Fairview in northern Oklahoma around 1 in the morning on Sunday, followed by a 2.6 quake, 1.37 a.m. near Quinton in eastern Oklahoma, and the USGS reports a 2.7 tremor in uh, Wacomus in northern Oklahoma at 4.25 p.m. Saturday. <clears throat> there have been 143 earthquakes overall in the last in Oklahoma in the last 30 days, and the increasing level of seismic activity in that part of the nation definitely has a lot of people of edge. Of course, greater concern is uh, the ma two major quakes that hit California in July were followed by more than a hundred thousand aftershocks. And scientists are warning that this may have increased stress on parts of the major dormant fault line. The dormant fault line, which they're talking about, is the Garlock Fault. The Garlock Fault runs directly into the San Andreas Fault. And it said, uh, the scientists have said it has not produced any significant activity since records began, and now it's becoming uh, quite active, clearly. One day there will be a massive quake that fundamentally alters the geography of Southern California, and let us hope that that day is delayed for as long as possible. Meanwhile, we have witnessed some unusual rumbling further north. Five large earthquakes, in fact, were detected off the Oregon coast last month. Um, dated October 21st, we have a magnitude 4.6 quake Monday morning became the fifth to strike Oregon. So clearly there is a lot of troubles here. Um, it's near the Cascadia subduction zone, with Steve Quayle recently told... Greg Hunter, that someday the Cascadia subduction zone will suddenly come to life and it will be the greatest natural disaster that we have seen in history. Now, it could produce tidal waves between 500 to 1,500 feet tall. It will be 3.5 million refugees to take care of. And you know what's not mentioned here, and this alarms me greatly, is the fact that when any nuclear waste or nuclear power plants that are in California that would go into the water would create a nuclear disaster that would dwarf the problem of the 3.5 million refugees. And I'm amazed that uh, uh, the end of the American dream here, the economic block, collapse blog, excuse me, hasn't said that. The San Andreas Fault in the subjection zone, quite active and uh, more than mildly worrisome. 
And that, friends, brings us to what you've been waiting for, the dum dee dum dee dum dee of the day. Let me get our dum dee music going here. Here we go. Perfect. Once again, if you don't know why we do the dumb beat music. If you don't know why we do the dumb beat music. The dumb beat music is done because it's the dumbest story that I have seen of the day. We also do the dunce cap of the month. Once a month. I'm only doing two shows a month. Again, it's been that way for a moment. Um been difficult without the behind the scenes queen. I won't lie. Uh, Humansarefree.com. Al Gore made nearly $200 million from the global warming scam, likely to become the world's first carbon billionaire. Now, how many of you lefty crybabies are sitting there talking about how there's white privilege and there's rich privilege? And there's this privilege and that privilege, and there's the privilege of not being privileged enough, privilege, privilege, privilege. All right, look. The man who is supposedly standing up for all these privileges are taxing everyone, including the incredibly poor, every time they heat their house, cool their house, buy their car, or work, gas up their car, buy food, anything. He's making billions off, you idiots. That's why you get the dumdy of the day. Ten years after the release of Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth, which we all know was nowhere near factual, none of the film's dire climate change predictions have come to pass. However, in the decades since the documentary was produced, its creator has raked in millions and millions of dollars from the entire global warming scam and now is posed to become the first carbon billionaire that is sourced. It is from a dailyfinance.com. In the 2006 film, Gort made a number of wild claims regarding what we could expect to see happening over the next 10 years due to global warming, but virtually none of the golden goose egg of his alarmist prognostications have come true. They've all turned out to be false. For instance, the film predicted that the Arctic ice, that the Arctic, excuse me, could become ice-free within the next decades, and the polar bears would begin drowning. Both claims are untrue. Now, again, this isn't a maybe. These are things he predicted 10 years ago that is provable has not happened. This is not opinion. This is provable fact. As reported by Investors Business Daily, in the mid to late 2000s, Gore's repeat, Gore repeatedly predicted that an ice-free Arctic Ocean was coming soon. But as usual, his fortune-telling was wrong, kind of like me picking football games the last two days. By 2014, Arctic ice had grown thicker and covered a greater area than it did when he made his prediction. There's more ice, idiots! And the polar bears? Daily Caller, another source. They report a new study by Canadian scientists once again debunks the notion that polar bears are currently being harmed by global warming. Researchers with Canada's Lakehead University found no evidence. Golden goose egg! Polar bears are currently threatened by any warming. Kilimanjaro's snow has not disappeared. Another prediction made by the film made in the film was that Mount Kilimanjaro would be snow free within the decade. But in fact, in 2014, ecologists actually monitoring Kilimanjaro's snowpark found it was not even close to being gone. It may have shrunk a little, but ecologists were confident that it would be around for the foreseeable future. Considering that we're ending, uh, going into a cooling period like we've never seen with things on the ice, or on the sun, on the ice, on the sun, we're going to be seeing a whole lot of ice built up there, I'm sure. Um, extreme weather has failed to materialize in inconvenient truth. Gore also forecasted that storms would begin occurring more often and at higher intensities. Wrong again, Al. Uh, Gore claims in more... Gore's claim is more hype than actual science, since storms aren't more extreme since 2016. In fact, not even findings from the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change supports Gore's claim. 
even his own side. The IPCC found that 2013 is, there is limited evidence of changes in extremes associated with other climate variables since the mid 20th century. The IPCC, who supposedly believes in this bunk, also found no significant observed trends in global tropical cyclone frequency over the past century and no robust trends in annual numbers by tropical storms. Hurricanes and major hurricane counts have been identified over the past hundred years in the North Atlantic Basin. Gore should probably take these findings seriously since he shared the Nobel Prize in 2007 with the IPCC for its work on global warming, which isn't happening. Lastly, despite false claims, Gore grows richer with the climate myth from the climate myth. Although Gore's claims have been thoroughly debunked by a number of experts, he has been quietly amassing a huge fortune based on the climate change scam. Mad World News reports, Gore's wealth went from 700000 in 2000 to an estimated worth of $172.5 million by 2015, thanks to his environmental activism. Oh, well, he's just doing it for the trees and the polar bears. Not for the billion dollars, no. Gore and the former chief of Goldman Sachs Asset Management made nearly $218 million in profits between 2008 and 2011 from a carbon trading company that they co-founded. Global warming. Warming his pocketbook. By 2008, Gore was able to put a whopping $35 million into hedge funds and other investments. So there you go, friends. There's your dumdy of the day. No proof of global warming. All kinds of proof that every prediction that this fraud made concerning it didn't come true. Thank you for listening, friends. Good night. God bless. And please share if you can. And uh, like I said, Say a prayer for your humble host. Things have just been a mess.